<laughs> right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of uh, Soshing with Suntwe. Today, we have in our presence the famous, the wonderful Carl Nure. And notice <laughs> I said uh, Nure and not Inkubi. Inkubi. Our... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's been Newbury before. <laughs> When I was in the UK, it's like, Mr. Newbury is here to teach us from Africa. That's amazing. Carl Newbury. <laughs> so, guys, um, if you're already with us, drop a comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, give the video a share. Tag your mates. Do all the rest of it. Just bear with us for a few seconds while we also share on our side with our phones and, yes. and whatever. Um, yes. so let, let me share with my left hand some, somehow <laughs> on my screen. I was like, please um, watch now. Yeah, get involved. And there like always, are. if you're there and you're watching, get involved in the conversation. Drop your comments. Drop your uh, drop whatever you want in the comments. We'll bring them up on screen. We'll address them. Um, this is meant to be interactive. It's meant to be a conversation, not between just the two of us, but with everybody else. So, yeah, enjoy, guys. And uh, if you enjoy it, bring others in. Uh, Excellent. Tell your see. enemies. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your enemies. We love the haters on the comments. Yeah, bring haters. Bring haters. Yeah, it's bring fun. Haters. Yeah, they make it interesting. Keep us honest as well. <laughs> this is the only democracy. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you say something that's hateful and not constructive, we just boot you anyway. We, we just remove you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we we'll just get blocked. Put you on tu- we'll put you on Twitter jail. That's what we do. <laughs> Right, I think I've got uh, what I've been trying to achieve down. Um, so, Excellent. oh, it's been yes. what two years since we saw each other, man. Dude, it feels like just yesterday when you were trying to teach me how to slack slack lining. <laughs> <laughs> they had the busy house, and I'm like, I'm not doing this that close to crocodiles. I'm not going to do that, like. Yes, I understand you in the last Avengers movie, but we're not going to do this. The kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> that, was that was a really great day. That was uh, uh, you, me, um, Arthur Evans was with us. Yeah, it, it was. It was. Yeah, it was, what an eventful day. I have we a won't talk about, We won't talk about photo. everything else that happened in Puloe at that time, but we, yeah, in Big Falls, we were having fun. Yeah, there was a photo that was taken, and I was doing this to the camera. Do you remember? Oh, really? <laughs> that, that looks like something you would do, right? <laughs> I can't remember the context of it, but it was uh, it was it was fun anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you see me looking all ADB and like looking like this the whole time, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because I've got no, no, no. I've got other screens going on here. Oh, yes. Matrix. Yeah, I'm watching comments on phones and watching things on screen so that we can uh, make sure we, uh, we're good. we got Christine Robinson saying, Hi, Paul and Carl. Hope you're both well. It's so very hot here in Brentwood, Essex. You would think I was wow. in Zimbabwe or SA. I'll tell you what. Today has yeah. been a beautiful day in the UK. And um, sun is out. Sun is shining. I am I was sweating in my office today, which is... Uh, oh, wow. Which is uh, yeah, strange. <laughs> does this mean? Does this mean the temperature was fifteen degrees today? I think it's. I don't know what it is. It's probably around twenty six. Twenty. Wow, that's insane. Oh, but the, by the way, we're in July. We're in July. So, have we gone past that bank holiday yet? Or was it? Or was it before? Mm, this is I bank holiday know. where everyone takes off all their clothes, and and it's it's super hot in the carnival and everything happens at that time. Maybe it's still coming. Oh, okay. But I'm, 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 an S- I'm, I'm an Essex boy, actually, uh, except I don't wear white socks. But I, I pretty much lived in Essex um, like 98 until 2002, I think. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. From when so to when? I was uh, to 90, 1998, 1998 until 2002. Oh, good four years then, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's usually the right amount of time you need to stay in Essex. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie uh, Rosie Erky says uh, it's twenty five degrees. The rest of the comment was just blowing smoke up my ass. This is basically looking for twenty five. 
25 <laughs> degrees. Okay, okay. Yeah, in Victoria Falls standards, that's very cold. Yeah, but the funny thing is, is that in Vic Falls, it feels cold at that st at that uh, that temperature. Whereas here, no, it feels hot. Yeah, we we have that little thing that's blowing smoke the entire time, twenty four seven. That doesn't switch off. It's like a it's like a standard aircon unit that you can't adjust. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, Christine Robinson says in Essex it's been 26, so I was spot on with my guess. Oh, 26. Oh, okay. That's uh, yeah. That's that. That's that's blazing. I I used to remember the I used to remember the weather report where the weatherman will say tomorrow it's going to be 18, so we're going to go out and have a picnic. It's going to be a nice sunny, bright day. I was like, 18. What are you talking about? The country in Zimbabwe shuts down at 18. This is <laughs> you will be wearing this jackets. Is Gweru, this is Gweru weather. Nobody comes out in the Midlands when it's 18. Yeah, you'll be wearing jackets and, and woolen hats. Dude, you can spot a Zimbabwean on a game drive. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you go out on a game drive at 6 a.m. in the morning and, like, I would be the only person with this blanket on still when we get back into camp at 11 o'clock and the sun is, like, right up above. And I'm like, <laughs> it's still freaking cold out here at 25. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Sorry, Carl. You, where, where did you where did you actually grow up? Were you where, did you grow up in Bulawayo? Well, you know what? I, I grew up all around Zimbabwe. I think I think the travel gene started when my parents split up when I was five. So I, I was born in Bulawayo in, in Southwold, uh, actually, and um, I I grew up like most of my life thinking that I was coloured. Uh, because I lived in, in Southwold, and which was a big colored community. And my father was very light skinned. And only mm -hmm. to find out when I was about 11 or 12 that I was actually black. So it was a very weird culture shock. Uh, can, you, can you clarify <laughs> for those who might be watching who are not from Zimbabwe? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ex what exactly. that means. Because yeah, so, if, if I even so, so say that, mixed, I'll be hanged. Exactly. So when you're mixed race in Zimbabwe, unlike in other parts of the world, you you are colored. So if your you know, parents are, are you know white and black or or they're both mixed race, then uh, there's a very strong colored community in, in, in Zimbabwe, which I'd like to say is the coolest community in Zimbabwe because the colored community is always up with all the cool stuff because of the, you know, like the links to South Africa and, you know, all the food is great in the colored community. The slang is great. The women are more beautiful. I don't know what it is, but it, there's something in the water there that just says, you know, colored is better. <laughs> no, it's absolutely. Flavor. It took two, <laughs> two, two things, mixed them, and created flavor. It's something exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so when I grew up, when I grew up in Southwold, I, I literally thought that you know, uh, because also that's the nice thing about Zimbabwe is that the colored community has created a, is almost like a subculture, um, that that is more progressive. You you find like the parenting is very different. Uh, mm. Some of the, the the norms and the cultures amongst them not as stiff, but borrowed a lot because you've got a lot of diversity. You find people who are like, oh, I'm half Irish or half German and whatever. So there's quite a lot of uh, exciting stuff that's in the color community. Whereas you find if you're black, there's a lot of restrictions. If you're Shona or you're in Devila, there's a certain way you do things. So um, yeah, but so but anyway, yeah, coming back to where I grew up. Yeah, but but when when I grew up in Bulawayo, my my parents split up, so I moved around with my mom. Lived in Mutare, Marondera, Harare. Uh, eventually went to school at Prince Edward. So I spent most of my time in, in Harare, I would say. But uh, going back to the, the, the colored community thing, there's two cultures on this planet. You're right. Jamaicans and, right. and Zimbabwean colored people who are just born with swag. Yeah, yeah of course. Of course. Like, I, like you, if you're Jamaican or... or um, or uh, or Zimbabwe colored, you yeah. are you are cool without even being without having to do anything. Oh yeah, ab absolutely. I I also think even when you look at uh, some of the achievements that we've had in in the country, like a lo a lot of people who just like happen to be colored, happen to have done like some amazing things from your Amara Browns to Axel Jeffries, you you know like uh, Karen Staley. You've you, you've got this list of like just amazing people that have uh you know represented zimbabwe in such an amazing um uh you know i you know people always wonder like why i talk about race a lot but it's i i find it's as a comic it's one of the things that unifies people when i do bring out some of these because people aren't, aren't comfortable enough to talk about it and so it creates this uh 
almost like a terrible mystery between white and black or colored and Indian or whatever it is in Zimbabwe, as opposed to unifying people. Mm. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> it's something that <laughs> we got. We got a couple of comments here. Um, one from Travis Norki. He says, "You mentioned haters. Is that Greg by any chance?" Well, <laughs> any 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 hater. If you're gonna be negative, be negative. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, "No reply to my first comment ever." Well, you got your reply now, Trav. So, <laughs> 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 And then uh, Matthew Jolliffe, got any decent jokes? <laughs> you know, I, I think I think COVID has like literally like slapped every single joke out. I I, I noticed Facebook has created this uh, Facebook rooms, and I'm thinking of getting back into comedy again by maybe like inviting thirty people to to listen to some of the jokes I've been writing and see if I'm still funny. I you know I I think I've lost it to some extent. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. It's not, <laughs> not something you're doing with. I don't think you've lost anything. Then we've got Gary Grease. Can you see when I put the comments on the screen? Can you see them? Yeah, yeah I can see them. I can see them. I like that comment. Don't tune them rough <laughs> or they'll file you smooth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. don't check me out like a sidewinder. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what the hell is that? It's, it sounds cool. <laughs> so so you, you moved around a lot, you said. And then, so... Yeah. Obviously, what what was your ambition when you were when you were lighty when you were still growing up? For those of you outside, lighty is slang in Zim for, for young um, Exactly. Were you, were you always wanting to go down the comedian route? What was your first ambition? So, so the the weird thing is that I always wanted to be famous, right? I I, I didn't know what that meant. So I thought I was going to be famous as like an artist. I love to draw. Um, okay. My, my dad, my dad was the comedian. In fact, he he used to perform comedy at weddings, uh, Nisbet Castle, and so on. I uh, used to do a lot of uh, functions as as a comedian. And I, you know, my dad would ask me to tell his jokes. So I never thought comedy was a thing for me. I always thought it was my dad's thing. He had ownership of it. Uh, so when when I grew up, I I never saw myself going into that line of things. However. I wanted to actually manage my dad. So when I got into business in advertising, I thought I'm going to manage my dad. I'd looked at big comics like Bill Cosby and so on. I know it's a bad example, but my dad loved Bill Cosby. But um, I a thought lot of I was going to manage. Before he fell from grace. Yeah. Exactly, and and I I literally studied the business of comedy for the purposes of managing my dad. But my dad oh, was wow. just too afraid. He was too afraid to do a show where people just come to watch him. So. I did a show to just show my dad how it was going to work. But before I knew it, the press got a, a hold of it. Everybody loved it. And so I ended up becoming a stand-up comic, which happened quite late in my life, in my 30s, actually. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good speech, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, so, so you started in your 30s with the, with the comedian. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. So what were you doing before that? What was your what was your um sort of career path up to that point? Yeah, so you know, definitely like filmmaking. I, I you know, I wanted to make movies when I grew up and I was drawing, I wanted to be an animator, I wanted to make, you know, I, I basically followed the path of like Walt Disney, this is what I wanted to do. And I wanted to get into movies, uh, special effects, visual effects. Um so even when I was like 16, my my parents were already against that path, which is why you know, my mom was on the tip that, listen, maybe you should go to England, uh, study nursing, get a profession under your belt. And then only then can you then pursue what you want to do. And so when I was like 17, 18, I was sent to England, um, studied nursing, uh, dropped out, then came back home um, and then pursued wanting to get back into film and television. So that that was basically what my path was going to be was film, television, advertising, anything within the realm of media was was basically what I wanted to do. Okay, interesting. We've got a, 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 a comment here. I don't know if we should take it now or later because yeah. <laughs> it's inside information. Um, yeah. Lynn Gwynn was saying, how's Bumblebee coming on? Love watching the build. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, so Bumblebee, she's, um, yeah, so right now, we still have to fix the bedroom right now. As you can see, there's uh, the ceiling. We're still working on that. Uh, we've worked on everything up to the kitchen, which is where my wife is right now. Hi, Nelsie. Yeah, hey Nelsie, Nelsie, Paul, say what's up. And, and that duck, 
that dark space in the back there is where the shower, the bathroom and toilet is going to be. So we're, we're still working on it, but uh, due to economic challenges and the COVID, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, it's, it's kind of been a little bit slow, but, but we're getting back into it. We're using a lot of recycled materials. Uh, so now production has picked up again. Nice. And where, where is Bumblebee parked? Uh, so Bumblebee is parked in the, one of the campsites, which is right in town. So in rest camp. We're uh, at the rest camp. Yeah. So we're right. We what we call black camping. So we're not really in the wild. We're <laughs> we're in the wild with a fence. Uh, <laughs> we get to see elephants, but far away. Or we get to hear hyenas, and they don't come into into the camp. But it's it's uh, it, it's been pretty cool because. Uh, for, for us, you know, rest camp has remained uh, sort of close to the public as well, but we are we're in there like as long-term residents, so that's, you know, it's been pretty cool for us. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Okay, so where did we get up to? We got up to that you uh, came back from uh, from nursing from training. From the UK. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, you know, for us, we, we um, you know, when I got into advertising, I started my own ad agency. Um, you know, it was really great. Got to learn a lot about a lot of different disciplines. Because when you work in advertising, you're working with a lot of clients. So people usually ask, you know, how come I know so many different things? But that's because in advertising, you kind of have to. You, you'll you be approached by a client that does, uh, you know, detergents versus a client that's doing mining. And so it was quite a huge learning curve between 2002 and 2008 is servicing a lot of clients but i fell in love particularly in the hospitality industry when when we were handling clients like african sun because i was doing their standards manuals and going around to the hotels and seeing exactly how they put things together so so that was my um you know that was my understanding of of hospitality and that's where i met my wife uh nelsie uh because she was a client with african sun hey, and yeah, the yeah. Way you say it <laughs> we weren't even like that that's my wife complaining in the background <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Matthew Jolliffe can't breathe. <laughs> Thought that was very funny. Um, this is Max Tansley is um, is a, a mate of mine here in the UK that I kayak with here. Uh, he's oh, been wow. very kind to me since I've been here and, and lent me kayaks and taken me paddling and all the rest of it. He's asking what kind of truck is Bumblebee. Oh, so so we we were lucky in that uh, one of the companies, Wild Horizons, was getting rid of a of a bus. Uh, it had been stripped, no engine, no wheels. Um, so basically, the idea was that since my wife and I don't know how to drive, we thought let's build a caravan. By the time we're done building the caravan, we might know how to drive, and then we can drive it out to some rural location and park it. So it's a basically it's a Toyota Coaster, a twenty five seater with no engine, no wheels. Um, it's currently just sitting on the ground at, at the moment uh, until it can be put onto a trailer and then driven around. Oh, excellent. And uh, Rosie Erke is saying uh, she wants to live like this too. She, Rosie's the, <laughs> for, for want of a better description, she's basically my godmother. She's like my other oh. mother. <laughs> hey, <Yeah>. Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Travis, oh. Is, is that like glamping but glamping? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Because exactly. there's glamping and then the, I like the glamping. I think I'll, I'll use this for a domestic tourism initiative. <laughs> yeah, I reckon that's a good thing. You should, you should uh, keep yeah. that and put it into one of your sets. Yeah, because I'm like glamping, definitely. I, I always notice the difference between um, a lot of the white customers that come into rest camp and mm -hmm. a lot of the black people that come because a lot of the black people will stay in the chalets and the lodge as opposed to coming out into the campsite. And in the campsite, there's more white people. Just generally, that's the, the observation that we've made over really? the last year, year and a half. Yeah. So, um, but only during carnival that, that we're starting to see a lot more black people coming in and doing camping. Um, so, so we, 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 when we've interrogated this a lot, we've noticed my wife and I, we were completely averse to the idea of camping. In fact, we hated the idea. But it was a lot of our white friends who took us glamping first that made us understand the whole culture behind it we we didn't grow up with tents a lot of my white friends had a tent by the time they reached their eighth birthday and so <laughs> you know in, in now in our communities you you will find a lot of people will start camping when they're like 30 or 40 years old um yeah. so it's quite an interesting thing where we're like okay we've now figured out maybe how we can introduce black people into camping is glamping is the actual solution itself yeah that's cool 
That's a cool plan. Yeah. So, so the transition to comedy. Yeah. It's so were you managing were you trying to manage your dad and learning all of that as a 30 year old man already? Like your dad was doing it much later life. No, so so I, I started in I think in my late twenties where uh -huh. I started researching uh comedy. Uh, because one of the things in advertising, you have to do a lot of copywriting. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, I just had a knack for writing great copy for, for my clients, uh, writing great jokes and stuff. But I just never liked the idea of performing on stage. And so I started to look at my dad as a possible solution where I could transfer all my writing and my dad could be the person who's on the stage delivering this. And mm. so, you, you know, for the longest time, trying to convince my dad, it, it was very difficult to to do that, you know. Um, uh, and, and also I, w I was using this to reconnect with my dad because I didn't live with my dad growing up. So I, I felt this was one way the two of us could work on a project, uh, you know, to, to, together. Um, the transition then into comedy, I then just get, got forced into it from the sheer frustration of not being able to convince my dad that he really should consider this as, a, as an actual all-out career, uh, not, not as an MC of weddings, but people could come and watch Charles Mouve performing. You know, mm. that's the one thing that he couldn't he couldn't wrap his head around to say, could I possibly have people, 400 people just come and watch me perform as opposed to being at a wedding or at a funeral? <laughs> Funny enough, uh, <laughs> people were like a captive audience. So this was your day job at the time was in the, the advertising world. What was your dad doing at the time? Uh, so, so my dad is, uh, you know, was okay. He's late now, but he was uh, what you call it—a woodwork teacher at uh, woodwork technical graphics and metalwork at Founders First, and then oh. Gifford. Yeah, and then after that, he uh, became the resident. He became the resident father at a um, at a center that rehabilitated street kids. So oh, wow. it, it gave them vocational skills. Uh, it's called uh, Tutuga in 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 Bulawayo. So you know that's what he was doing at the at the time that he he died. Oh, interesting. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. that he, he's no longer with us. Yeah. Yeah, oh. but he's, he's, he's here somehow. You know, I keep the beard in remembrance. <laughs> I... <laughs> His blood is running through your veins. You will never... Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking advantage of the genetics to the fullest effect possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So when, when was your, your formal sort of like... When did it happen that you became... A comedian because obviously yeah. there's a transitionary period where you thought about it then you did it what yeah. do you think was the defining moment when you were like okay i am a comedian okay so it, it was it was a very distinct day um in the sense that um okay sorry two days um the first day um was uh you know because i was married before and uh and then when when i kind of was sort of in in when i liked nelsi for example I wasn't divorced at the time. And yeah, like I was going through a divorce and, you know, I, I suppose Nelsie never looked at me that way because she was like, oh, but you're married. Like, I don't, you know, they, they, they couldn't possibly be anything. I and remember so her I, telling me this whole story, actually, when we were sitting at Zambezi house having dinner the one night. Nelsie yeah. gave me the whole long story. But anyway, you carry on. Exactly. So, so, so eventually when I did get the divorce, I called Nelsie up and I'm like, hey, what's up? So I got that divorce. You want to hang out? And <laughs> and so we went to hang out at Prince Edward School to watch the, the rugby because I'm an old boy. We've gone there to watch the rugby. And we spent the whole day and Nelsie was just laughing at everything that I was saying. Like even stuff that wasn't funny, right? Like Nelsie was just... <laughs> I heard that in the record. I'm sick. <laughs> exactly. And, and Nelsie was just... Nelsie was just laughing at her ass off and she was like... You know, at some point she was like, "You really need to consider doing this as a as a profession." Now, I I never, you know, I you know, I was like, "I've heard this before," but you know, I, you know, I I'm just too afraid to do it. But then another friend of mine, Tarirone Gitare, who's a, another a famous uh, musician in Zimbabwe, I used to work with her. And the one time Tariro asked me to come and just tell two jokes at one of her functions, and it was at that function that I I just told two jokes and then I added two more. And everybody started raving about Carl Joshua Mube has now become a, a stand-up comedian. Previously, I was known as an, as an animator. And so now the press started writing about, oh, animator turned comedian. It was now in the press. Oh, wow. And I started, I started freaking out. 
we had to sit down and then craft an actual business plan. According to what I wanted to do with my dad, we crafted a, like a 10-year business plan. We sat down and we said, this is how, if we're going to do this, uh, Nelson, if we're going to do this, this is how it's going to work. And and basically, it, it, it just became, yeah, the thing that we used to open the door so people could know all the other things that I could do. That's impressive. Yeah. Very, very cool. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice when something like this, where, where it, it almost happens effortlessly. Right, right, right. Do you have yeah, I, any... So, so, when that happened, I mean, what went through your head? You're like, should I just take this and run with it? Or were you like, wow, this is a dream come true? What, what, was, what was going through your mind when that transition happened? I, I, I think, firstly, what, what I would understand by it was that it became a burden. It, it like you know when sometimes when you're thinking about something you think about it long enough and you think about how you you know your plan of execution and you hit brick walls to try and convince people that this works and then finally what happens is that an opportunity presents itself and sometimes it doesn't appear like it's an opportunity it feels more like a burden mm. and you know i i tried to run away from it i literally i remember that day uh when i was supposed to do this function for tariro i i was literally on my way home and I was like, I'm not going to do this function. I'm just going to call Tari and say, listen, I chickened out. I couldn't do it. And then she called me up when I was halfway on my way to, to get the combis. Almost halfway between the combis and where the venue was. And I remember one of my friends, uh, Rufaro Jiwai, who I was with, just said, listen, let's just go. You just need to do it. And it, it just weighed so heavy on me. I got so sick. I felt like throwing up. You know, I even got to the venue. I spent most of my time in the toilet. And even when I came out, it was the most horrible feeling ever. I, I, would, I would describe it like you're, you're giving birth. You know there's a child coming. But mm. nothing, nothing stops the pain of that child coming through. I mean, you know it's going to be rewarding. But it, it was the worst experience possible at the time. But now when I look back at it, I now realize that those nerves were perfect because... I didn't take the audience for granted and I've never taken an audience for granted because of nerves. I think that's the most important part of it is that burden that people have paid or they've come to watch you. And so your, your obligation is to make sure that you deliver the best you possibly can. Hmm. Just, um, just to, to answer Trav, Trav yeah. Moki saying, sorry, I must've missed it. Whereabouts are you blamping? <laughs> yes. We're blamping in Victoria Falls. Uh, right in rest camp in the middle of, of town. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Matt Jolliffe also answered the question for, for Trav. So so oh, that's cool. interesting. So you actually do suffer from some some sort of nerves and uh, not not I wouldn't say oh. to the extent of stage fright, but um but how do you how do you deal with that before going on for a show? So I I think in the first three years of my of my career I I hated the nerves. But, uh, you know, fellow comics will kind of help you understand. And one of the things that was explained to me by, there's this gentleman who's called Stephen Rosenfield, who, who I, I think is like the comedy whisperer. He, he basically sits in a room and comics tell him his jo the, their jokes and he basically helps them to joke edit. And if people uh, uh, don't understand, like comedy is a very technical thing. And so mm -hmm. sometimes using the number 16 in terms of instead of 17 is funnier sometimes or sometimes it's better for the person in the joke to be a man and not a woman or it's yeah. better for you to be the villain and not the hero and so Stephen Rosenfield would often say to me that when when you get nervous your adrenaline peaks in your body your blood circulation goes up uh, you you your your pupils are dilated but these are signs that nobody can see. In fact, the only symptom that can be seen on the surface is excitement. So if you've ever noticed a gazelle being chased by a, a cheetah, for example, it actually looks excited on its face. Hmm. And that's because adrenal what adrenaline does, it delivers excitement. So when a comic goes on stage, and so when, when I was told this, I now embraced the nerves. So I feel nervous. I actually use my nerves as a ritual. Uh, I, I often talk about the fact that I spend like probably most of the day in the toilet, like literally diarrhea. I get that sick every single time. And for the last 10 years, it's been the same. But for me, it's become a ritual of understanding that I am definitely going to kill it because there are things outside of my own control. I'll be able to use these nerves to do. 
I'll be able to, it, it, like the nerves slow down time. When you're nervous, mm. you see the room much slower. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure you'll notice it because like for, for me, you're like my personal real life hero. You're like, when I watch Avengers, I'm like, I know a real life person who can take down Thanos. And I know <laughs> you, <laughs> I, I, Jeez, that, that's that's a bit much. Yeah, but but I know I know that no, but a lot of people take it for granted because they're like a lot of the stuff that you do. I'm sure when you're like, for example, when you're kayaking, right? You have this. It's like the world is so slow. Everyone thinks you're doing something that's super quick, but for some reason, that adrenaline slows the whole world down. You can make you can make this this decision making is so insane, and people yeah. don't even realize the power that this like adrenaline has of slowing this time down for you. That, that's call, why, st- yeah, we call it flow state. All right, okay. <laughs> when you read flow state, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's if it's climbing, whether it's kayaking, whether it's skydiving, whether it's paragliding. There's just that moment where you reach flow state, and it's exactly as you said. The 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 adrenaline kicks in. Everything slows down, and your muscle memory and your um, your 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 training and everything that you've practiced and put into your body starts to just happen by itself, and you just find yourself doing what needs to be done at exactly the right moment, getting through the situation, and that you just reach that flow state. But then on other yeah. days, you go down the same river with the same rapids, and you get fucked up the whole way down. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely, and I, I was gonna say. What's interesting about um, what's interesting about adrenaline as well is that you, when you mention muscle memory, because this, this is a very important part of it, all of the practice, all of the hours, all of the time that you put, right, is there to prepare you for a moment like this. But even if you're not prepared, the state of panic, you know, when you run around like a headless chicken, even that is an, an amazing defense mechanism because you can almost imagine how, how shit scared a lion gets when a human being just runs around like a headless chicken, like if I, if, if I just started running around in a weird way in front of an elephant, it, it won't know the, the hell to do. In fact, the elephant probably gets even more afraid. So it's a defense mechanism to do that. And quite often in comedy, what people don't realize is even when you t- take them on a journey with a joke, uh, you know, when you set the joke up and then the punchline takes them on another tangent, that laughter is a defense mechanism of, oh, holy shit, what happened, right? Because that... Your, your body doesn't know how to deal with it. So it just laughs uncontrollably because, you, you you know, and it's a defense mechanism. And it's a beautiful thing. I think the adrenaline shared by the performer and the person experiencing the comedy, mm. it, it's this beautiful relationship that actually uh, happens. So I embrace, I embrace fear right now. Uh, that's the prime reason why I do comedy now. Well, one of one of my one of my life goals as well is to to do a TED talk. I know you've done one. Oh, but, um, yeah. I I actually was in the process I've of done two. Ah, oh, damn it! <laughs> well, <laughs> but, yeah, so we'll talk about your two. But I I was uh, in the process of pursuing doing a TED talk, uh, and then COVID hit and stuffed all the TED talks up. And wow, um, okay. And the TED talk that I wanted to do was basically going to be, I was still working on the, the concept, but I wanted to do a talk on fear, uh, fear, the friend that you think is your foe. Right, right, right. So I think, because for me personally, like I tell this to everybody, no one no one believes me. There are certain people who believe me who know me well, well enough, but I am yeah. a giant wuss. I am a coward. I am a wuss of all wusses. <laughs> what? Yes, I am. That's insane. I am. And my entire life has been this project with fear. From when I was a kid, I've I, I've been working against fear, working against fear, working against fear, and trying to overcome fear and trying to overcome fear. And so everything I've done in my life basically has been to do with that, trying to overcome fear and trying to 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 um to 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 experiment and see what fear is all about. And it's only in that realization that fear is actually your friend and not your enemy that really pushed yeah. me forward like exponentially but uh before we continue uh yeah. travis travis is saying uh, <laughs> right, guys, we're for dinner cheers carl good luck with the bumblebee build hope you come to yeah. a show in Fire city of kings how about a quick joke yes <laughs> yes, yes oh my gosh yeah that's uh, that's that's very um I, I you know i can't even think of a joke in my head uh, uh, uh what 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 do i have do i even have anything why are you thinking Max Hansley is saying yeah um, uh, no not that one 
Max Tansy is saying. What do you call it? <laughs> what? We'll get to that. Max Tansy saying, I'm going to use that mindset with nerves when kayaking whitewater. So, yeah, it's a good it's a good way to go. His other one is a joke for Travis, I think. Basically, yeah, what do you yeah. call a midget clear yeah, warning on the run from the police? And I know the answer. It's a small medium at large. <laughs> 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 I've heard that one before. This is, you see, this is the, this is the weird thing also about stand-up, right? This yeah. The weird thing about stand-up is that, like, a lot of the, a lot of people come up to you and they're like, hey, you know, tell us a joke, right? Which is the most bizarre thing that because, way. yeah, because some, sometimes, right? Sometimes the jokes are not really like, um, oh, there's this that happened to that guy and therefore punch him, yeah. right? Because sometimes it's like a, it's like a funny story. Like Absolutely. I was telling my friend, I was telling my friend Q a funny story about, but probably many people might not get this unless you, you know, you, you've been in Zimbabwe, but we were traveling on a double decker bus, right? And um, we're traveling on a double decker bus coming from South Africa. And you know, the double decker buses have a shorter sort of carriage where the passengers uh, sit at the bottom and then the rest of the passengers are at the top. And so this bus was going through a lot of breakdowns. And eventually we ended up in Mashingo. And if you know the, how the buses work, a blind guy gets onto the bus because there's a lot of like blind people that come onto the bus and they, they start singing, right? <laughs> and and so this guy comes into the bus and then nobody explains to the guy that this is a double-decker bus. <laughs> and, and, and so... And so he turns to the right and then, so what happens is that they start singing, right? They start singing and as they're singing, people put money into a cup. And so the people at the bottom were actually shocked at themselves that they weren't telling this blind guy that there aren't many passengers at the bottom. In fact, the passengers are right at the top. And so this guy just continues, he, he starts walking and sings like two verses and then reaches the end. And instead of telling the guy that, no, you're on the bottom deck, go to the top deck, there's more people there. The person at the back turns the blind guy and then so that he, he walks back. And so as he walks back, he reaches the end where the toilet is and starts banging on the door, thinking that that's where the driver is. At this point, nobody is even like telling this guy that, no, there's more passengers at the top. If you go to the top, there's more passengers. You probably get more money in this particular instance. But no, what he then, what what I then did, which is the worst thing, is I then go to the driver and tell told the driver, no, guys, you picked up someone who's blind in Mashingo. At this point, we've gone, we've gone like literally like ten k's out of Mashingo. Right, we've mm -hmm. gone ten k's out of Mashingo. The bus stops in the middle of nowhere. Open, he opens the door and lets this guy out. And then we just drive off. Like, so, like, so, exactly, right? That's not funny, right? No. What's, what's hilarious, what's hilarious to me is the Zimbabweans in the bus discussing this issue about what should have been done. And I was like, now I understand why we've got problems in our country. Because everybody theorized about what they should have done for this guy. But no one knows. did the right thing. Dude, they left him. There wasn't even a sign in sight. There wasn't even like a tree or nothing. He was facing the wrong direction. He was like, no, but like this guy could have like walked onto some random farm, right? And nobody would have known what the fuck was going on. But Zimbabweans, typical of Zimbabweans on the bus, we intellectualized this entire thing and started talking about how, I'm sure there's even people there who blamed it on the government. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and this is this is yeah, and it's just like a big problem that we have in our country. So, but the thing is, my 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 thing with comedy is like stories like that, for example, are very difficult to talk about in the sense of, oh, tell me a joke, for example, because like, normally when I talk about that story, it expands into a whole bunch of other things. So, I I, I suppose I'm more storytelling than I am um, maybe telling you know individual uh, jokes, and normally about things that people find most offensive. So the joke has nothing to do with disability, for example. It's yeah, more sure. to do with it's more to do with the lack of humanity. Yeah. yeah. Like, for example, if you go to if you go to uh, Grahamstown, there's a big library for the blind, which which is which is a, a probably a very important building, and there's a sign that says Library of the Blind, but above it, above it, and I'm not lying to you, written in Braille, right at the top of this building. 
<laughs> are the words library for the blind. Like, so as long as as long as, you're, uh, as long as you got a, a ladder, you can read it. Who, who thinks this shit? Like, how do you even know that someone has written in Braille two stories above a building? That's like, amazing. Who, yeah, so it, it's just, I think comedy is an exploration of the lack of humanity that we have in this world. Like, yeah, we like to think we're, we're, we're very conscious people, but geez, we are the biggest assholes this planet has ever created. <laughs> Christine Robinson is saying, you both have such infectious laughs. I, I'm sitting here smiling and laughing with you guys and doing some memories of my years living in Zimbabwe, Kwekwe and Bulawayo. And then, hey, uh, kindly, she's saying, if I remember correctly, Paul, you have a birthday coming up soon and wishing you a very happy oh, and really? blessed birthday. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, it's on the, on the 29th, a week today. Oh, wow. Super awesome. Uh, oh, I was going to guess what your star sign is, but apparently they've changed them. Have they? Like apparently, yeah, I think Reserve Bank added one more. Like, <laughs> they just changed the names. They added one. And changed the name. I think they just shifted the dates and, and and gave it like a new exchange rate or something. So I'm no longer a Gemini. I'm like an Aquarius or something. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's good. But yeah. only in Zimbabwe. Okay, so being here in the UK, I can keep my staff on. That's good. <laughs> Happy birthday in advance. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> I'm 35 years young now, which means, wow. uh, yeah, means, wow. uh, I've, I've, I've officially gone over the hill and now I'm st striving towards middle aged. No, you are eligible for Zimbabwean corruption. Once you reach 35, you are now youth. <laughs> but also, I've uh, have I not outlived the life expectancy in Zimbabwe? So I'm I'm I should be dead yes. by now. Yes, yes. Unless you become youth. <laughs> when you become the youth, you can, uh, you live you live long enough to become an MP, which is usually sixty five. <laughs> <laughs> ah, excellent. So, so yes, this is this time is flying past. We're already forty minutes. Left. <laughs> oh wow. Um, Tell me, where we met was when did you come to Vic Falls in twenty seventeen or twenty fifteen? Yeah, so funny story about that. We thought <laughs> I was in exile for about a year, uh, traveling Southeast Asia, jumping from couch to couch. Uh -huh. And um, w when we came back to Zim, we thought, listen, Robert Mugabe is still in power. If we if we if we move back to Zimbabwe, we're going to have to move somewhere where we can easily jump into another country. And so Victoria Falls came up as a <laughs> as a plan. And uh, and so literally, as we unpacked our bags in Victoria Falls. As we unpacked our bags, people were going onto the streets and marching, right? And uh -huh. so the Victoria Falls march happened. <laughs> and it was so weird because, like, people were out in Victoria Falls with their flags and whatever it is and, you know, uh, capes and, and that kind of... So that was the time that we moved. <laughs> that we I, moved might have, I might have had a little bit of something to, to do with that. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to talk about suspension and, uh, and how many people can fit in a truck. Jeez, my 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 drifter was literally never the same again after that. It ruined my entire suspension. There must have been at one point like forty people hanging off that truck. Yes, it was a sign of things to come. <laughs> <laughs> but my car was ruined. It was, it was absolutely <laughs> ruined by that by that um, that whole. But what? Mod. But what a day! But what a day though! What a day though! Because you you hardly see Victoria Falls. I mean, Victoria Falls is pretty segregated in a way. And it's not segregated out of uh, people wanting it to be that way. But I think yeah, economically, yeah. The, the town has just become segregated. You know, there's you know, there's the players, there's the agents, there's the owners, there's the GMs, there's the, the workers, then there's the rest of Victoria Falls. And for the first time, it was interesting to see everybody almost in the same... You know, I, I, I felt it, it, was a, it was a very different thing that I just haven't seen in a, in a while in, in, in this town. It was a, it was a very unifying experience, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've no, I spent, absolutely. I've I think compared to my uh, counterparts, I've spent a lot more time in, in Kosana and Chino Timba than a lot of my brothers and sisters. But that's because I'm friends with all the raft guides, and we all move together and hang out together right. and all the rest of it. But that was a very very very. Uh, and you're was, not black anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Patonga. Patonga. <laughs> exactly. 
My Tonga totem. But but having said that, sorry, just to just to cut you a little bit, this is one of the things that's always been my pet peeve also about uh, Zimbabwe is that, and, and I talk about it a lot in my comedy, uh, people always like, you know, why are you bringing up this whole thing about like white people and black people and so on? And it's because my pet peeve has always been that white Zimbabweans have never been regarded as Zimbabwean, in, not in the truest context. And I always make the joke that if you're white, you're only considered Zimbabwean if you win five gold medals, you know. <laughs> You know, then, 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 then all of a sudden you're like, do you, you know what I'm saying? But then all I, of a sudden you've got a farm. Yeah, and, and yet, and yet, a lot of the times I think I have been taught a lot more about Zimbabwe more by white Zimbabweans than I've learned from black Zimbabweans, and it's just, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's just a, a thing about how much pride people have in the country, and I think. I, I find it very bad when the politics just tries to separate us on a basis of race. And yet, like, for example, right, for example, you'd be like, you've got lots of, like, you've got lots of white players in the market and that kind of thing who are doing great things to push the brand of Zimbabwe from a tourism perspective, from a mm -hmm. cultural perspective, from a heritage perspective. And yet, on one hand, the politics is just brought in as a cheap thing to say, oh, look at those white people making money or look at this. And, and we separate ourselves like that. We, we're yeah. even doing it amongst ourselves. Oh, look at those developed people. Look at those China people. Oh, look at the guys in the diaspora. Oh, look at this community. Oh, look at those guys. And it, yeah. it's just such a sad thing uh, that happens in our country just des designed to, to separate us. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Which is yeah, yeah. just a sad thing. Yeah. But I, I also find it interesting because you say, like where you said, you've been taught a lot uh, by white Zimbabweans about Zimbabwe, etc. Where I think that's, that could be a very much a case of where when you stick inside your own bubble and culture, you stop learning and then right. you get exposed to new other things. Where So, for example, I have the same experience from uh, my, my friends in Chisuma and Dibu Dibu and Jembwe villages and stuff, where I've learned so much right. from... from from the black villages of Zimbabwe and and the the raft guides I've worked with and all the different things because it's completely it's completely different culture really at the at the base yeah. of it and um, yeah. because of that you know you have so much more opportunity to grow when you step outside of your own little bubble the whole time and yeah. I think that's an important message that people should really try and embrace cross yeah. cross cultural learning really. Um, no, absolutely. Like I'll even state for the people that are, are, are watching right now, uh, Paul just mentioned places I do not know where the fuck they are. Like it just, <laughs> sorry, excuse my, excuse my language. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Like he's just mentioned a whole bunch of places. I'm going to go Google after this and I'm going to be like, oh, what's that place that Paul mentioned? I was just nodding my head in silent approval like yes yes i do realize those villages that you've been to yes i, I might have heard about them once or twice in my life <laughs> yeah so i mean but to be fair like those those are the villages along the gorge yeah so you've yeah. got uh, you've no. got monde sizinda chisuma jembwe oh uh, sorry it's monde sizinda dibu dibu chisuma jembwe uh yeah move it and in Zlovu and all the way to jambezi yeah, I've I've written them down. I shall Google. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the. I think that's the. I think also that's the thing that's that's such a shame about how the world gets separated. You know, you you look at uh, you know all over all over Africa and, and stuff like that. We we just constantly get divided, and we we don't really look at the person who's sending the message, the divisive messages. Um, you mm -hmm. know, we're trying to make us look like we're not the same people. We don't love the same things. Yet, like like I was saying in the joke, that why does it take six gold medals for us to finally say, you know? Should every white person in Zimbabwe now get us gold medals for us to be like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's not fair, right? It's not like, you know, I, I even have a gold medal to be Zimbabwe. But I, I think we, but I think with social media, we're getting into this new realm of consciousness where we're actually beginning to see that, no, you know what, Zimbabwe is such a beautiful country. There's a lot more that brings us together than separates us. Um, you know, our variety is what makes us even more special. And we're just probably the coolest country in the whole continent. Yeah, I can get behind that. It's definitely yeah. unique. Like I've, I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't really traveled around Africa as much as I would have liked to. I mean, I've obviously yeah. been to the southern African countries, and then the only stuff sort of north of Zambia I've been to is uh, really Uganda. Um, right, right, right. Uganda's beautiful. Yeah, you, Uganda is a close second. 
Oh, really? Yeah. No, what, you know, what I love about Zimbabwe, I think it's like a merge of a lot of things. The weather systems are perfect. I think our tourist destinations are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think universally, when people come into our country, we're very uh, welcoming, very uh, intellectual as well, even if you're looking at... Cause you can Zimbabwe. bump into any Zimbabwe and they can help you as an investor anyway, just to make the right decisions on whether or not to put any money in this country. Mm. Zimbabwean and people mathematically, are very we're, we're very much ahead. Very sophisticated. Yeah. It's no, like no, absolutely. A, we, 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 we have 10 minutes left in sort of theory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's a loose 10 minutes, but... Uh, <laughs> So uh, we try and keep it around and oh, we're definitely going to have to do this again, you and me, because we haven't even <laughs> the of what I thought we were going to talk about. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just went off on a tangent, right? No, it's good because that's how it should be. Yeah. We, we should be having a, a nice discussion and a chat. It's not, uh, yeah. I don't want it to be rigid. It needs to, needs to be yeah. organic and let it flow. But before we like start finishing off, I just want to tell everybody who's there and watching that uh, thanks so much for coming and being a part of this because it really does mean a lot and it it does um, help a lot when we've got the interaction and the, and the engagement from you all. And uh, if you've got any specific questions or anything you'd like to say, start dropping them in now because we're going to wrap up in about ten minutes. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna give I'm gonna give them something that's going to bother them the entire time. So this entire chat. I've been trying to align my shoulder with yours. So so I've been keeping it right there just to make sure that we've got an aligned shoulder. It looks like we've got two heads on the same body. <laughs> so they, then they're not going to be able to unsee this the entire time. Because every time I do this, they're going to be like, ah, oh, you're screwing it up. And I'll bring it back here. Yeah, so that's basically, yeah. It's a, it's a game I've been playing this entire chat. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So <laughs> before before we wrap it up, what what... Tell me what it is that um, sort of drives you and keeps your mindset in a place. Because because like the stuff I wanted to talk to you about as well, which we will have to save for next time, is right. you and I are very similar in the fact that we have very entrepreneurial minds. Right. Where we look at yeah. opportunities and both, both you and I have the same thing where we throw ourselves headlong at opportunities quite a lot of the time. And for me personally, I've I've thrown myself headlong into a lot of brick walls as well. Right. And, right yes, exactly. That's part of the... <laughs> and had to scrape myself off the ground, dazed and confused, to then throw myself again at another brick wall. <laughs> and then wait, uh, scrape myself up again and then throw myself... And go, oh, this one's actually working. And then run with it for a bit. And then the next thing. And so what, what is it that in your mindset that you think keeps you going and pursuing and pursuing and pursuing without getting tired and without letting... Um, obstacles or failure is not the right word, but um, we'll we'll use the word failure because I'm lacking a different term now. And how do you stop failure from from stopping you in your tracks? Right. So I I mean you know the thing is you know when you play a board game right when you play a board game you 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 open up the game you know what the rules are you you know what to expect and I think you know whether you're playing stakes and ladders monopoly or whatever it is the most important thing is to know the game you're playing. And for me, uh, the entrepreneurial game, if you look at every other game that has been played by every success story, it has been met with the same things. But one of the things that entrepreneurs always forget is the obstacles. Mm. It's the failures. It's the, you know, having to try a hundred times and the 101 time is the, is the time when it works out. And normally it's the time when you're, you've given up pretty much you know uh, mm. sometimes it's the flexibility of being able to be known for one thing and 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 make yourself something completely different so i think the first thing is just knowing the game and i, I you know i i always take the opportunity to just watch a lot of movies not not fic- not fictional stuff i don't have to watch avengers when i've got poor so <laughs> like so for example i i, I look at I, I look at actual stories i i speak to real people and I find their journey is no different. You know, it, it, it's exactly the same thing. Usually when I hear a story that's very different, like a, someone just woke up in money, I, I usually stay away from that because it doesn't, um, it doesn't follow, it doesn't follow the game, the actual game that's being played of, of sometimes the social misfits, the, the rejects, the, you know, the, the, the guys that dare to dream, the guys who are called crazy. Those are the guys those are the guys that usually are the ones who set the trends. 
you can you can follow the trends. I think people are okay following the trends, but we are the guys whose books they're going to read. And they're not going to read any books that don't have chapters of failure before the success. Mm. And I think for me, that's the thing that, that says for every book that I would have read, for every game that I would have played, it all starts with right at the beginning, moving forward, going up ladders, coming down snakes. As long as you understand the game, you, 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 you can get emotional about it. Great. But you always have to throw the dice and you always have to move forward. It, mm. it, that's, that's the thing with everything. You just have to keep moving forward. You, you know what it's like being in Victoria Falls and trying to enter this particular market. Probably one of the most hostile business environments you could ever imagine being in. It's not, you, you come in here and you think everyone's going to like what you're doing. You think everyone's going to support what you're doing. But that's not the case. And you, you just have to stick it out. You just have to be the person, the outlier. Don't conform, you know. Always, <laughs> always be the person who's coming up with something new. Because later on, you're going to realize that you are the one who was setting the trend that everybody else was following. Mm. it's true it's um one of uh one of the things that really struck a chord with me um was a simple simple sentence that was said by someone close to me and they turned to me one day and they said it took me 20 years to become an overnight success right 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 absolutely because, because in, the eyes of, in the eyes of everybody on the outside the person was an overnight success but in the reality of the situation there's 20 years of failure 20 years of hard lessons 20 years of extremely hard work 20 years of endurance and um yeah 20 years to become an overnight success it's a it's a very that's that that i always think to myself it can take me 20 years but i'll be an overnight success uh, absolutely Absolutely. Like when I look at when I look at the lot of stuff that you do, I can't even begin to comprehend how I would even start because it's already too late. And the thing is, you're already that whole wealth, that library of information. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? That yeah, You know, like sure. at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, when let's say, for example, I know it's just a small example, but when Victoria Falls is struggling with a problem animal somewhere on the bridge, right? Nobody no everybody without hesitation is thinking you know who could solve this situation is poor right because they're like it, it's just one example right because i remember this um I, I can't remember what animal was it that was just stuck on the on the on on the bridge because there's many things there's been snakes there's been crocodiles there's been yeah, yeah. The so, exactly so but those those types of things happen because it's not because you you knew what to do overnight right mm. you you yeah, everybody, everybody sees you're crazy so much that when they don't have solutions, at that point, you become that beacon for them because you've mm. been working on your lights this, this whole time. They would never call someone who pretended with a flashy suit or whatever it is to say, come and deal with this issue. And so <laughs> I think, I think that's, that's the thing that people also miss the point when it comes to Zimbabwe or why Zimbabwe is going to be one of the leading sort of African countries is that what we're going through is preparing us it's preparing us for a time because everyone is talking about going green going off the grid trust me zimbabwe has been off the grid and going green all this time we've had no cash we've had like basically no electricity like if anybody understands how to live sustainably it's going to be a zimbabwe <laughs> it's true it's absolutely true um so one thing from rosie i would love to see the progress of the bumblebee it's such a cool idea to open up camping to the whole community from someone who helped her husband to carry a mattress to the top of a copy so you can camp outside the beautiful canvas of, uh, canvas of stars the magnificent african wow. sky um <laughs> wow. i believe you've got a facebook page dedicated to this don't you yeah yes so we've got uh, it's called alternative home sweet home it's a uh, alternative home sweet home so it basically just looks at creating alternative living uh, solutions um you know like we're trying to explore how we use lived culturally traditionally while using things that we're learning from the world at the moment because we believe there's a convergence somewhere mm. in terms of geodesic uh, geodesic uh, uh buildings and rural homes sort of similar sort of thought processes um that are there with Ndebele huts and so on so we we basically we're using this build process to understand building as a concept. And then we start looking at alternatives uh, of how to better house our people, um, even from a tourist perspective, as well as just an accommodation solution. Awesome. So 
I think we're going to wrap it up there. But um, will you okay. uh, drop the links to that in to, to your pages and everything in the comments? In, and in the yes. So that everybody Absolutely. can. Carl, it has been an absolute pleasure having you today. It's uh, Thank such you so much. an easy chat, such a nice flow. It, I think we achieved flow state in our little in our little cosmos here together today. And um, it, it was really... the adrenaline of, of how we started. <laughs> it's the adrenaline <laughs> from how we started. <laughs> I, I really, really, really enjoyed that, and I would love to have you back so we can chat more about other topics. Um, Whatever topics, I think you and I could uh, could could go on and on and on all day, every day. That's uh, it's probably a good thing we don't Absolutely. live in the same town anymore, because I don't think Absolutely. we're getting to it. So uh, <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for for coming, and um, thank you so much. It's been great. So we're gonna sign off now. Thank you everybody yeah, cool. for watching, and uh, remember that we're here every Wednesday, same time, seven p.m. CAT or six p.m. BST. And uh, if you know of anyone who you think would be interesting that wants to come and have a chat, drop their name in the comments to get them to inbox me. Let me know what, um, let me know who they are. And uh, yeah, I'm looking for people to chat to all the time. And um, let's keep this going as long as possible, because as long as I've got guests and as long as people want to watch, I will continue to do this and uh, dedicate this time to it. So uh, yeah, happy days, guys. And uh, it's cool. been fabulous. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.